We have been fragmented. We have been divided. We have been scattered into different groups, into different sects. So much so that a time has come that many Muslims will not pray behind other Muslims. Only Muslims are going to celebrate the birth of the Prophet. Shaitan won't celebrate the birth of the Prophet of Allah. The enemies of Islam will not celebrate the birth of Prophet Muhammad It's not a good day for them. It's a good day for us. But the question is, did the Sahaba celebrate? She's the one who suckled Prophet Muhammad and suckled Hazrat Hamza. So she becomes the Radai mother, the foster mother. And Hazrat Hamza, the uncle, and Prophet Muhammad become foster brothers. So Abu Lahab, a kafir, and we can say this with any doubt, he is been given some relief in the punishment, in the fire of hell, because he expressed happiness on the birth of Muhammad by freeing Suwayba. Now, Abdullah ibn Abbas عنهما, and Jubair bin Mat'am, they make mention that the Prophet of Allah was born on the 8th of Rabi'ul Awwal. Mahmoud Pasha, the great astronomer from Egypt, after his calculations, and we can't disregard that because they got the gadgets, he says the 9th of Rabi'ul Awwal. <laughs> Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Nahmaduhu wa nusalli ala rasulihil kareem amma ba'd. Rabbi shrah li sadri wa yassil li amri wa ahlul uqdatan min lisani yafqahu qawli. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Ya bani Israel adhkuru ni'mati al-lati an'amtu alaykum wa anni fadhaltukum ala al-alameen. Sadaqallahu al-Azim. As made mention last week, that tonight we're going to speak about the birth of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. The verse that I recited, I'm going to attach two or three more verses similar to this, and the collective message of these three, four verses are that if Allah Almighty has bestowed a favor upon us. We need to remember that favor. We need to thank Allah Almighty for that favor. And if we are to even celebrate that favor, that is in line with the verses that we are to recite. So this verse that I recited is from Surah Al-Baqarah. And it is verse number 47. And Allah Almighty says explicitly to the children of Yaqub alayhi salatu wassalam, that are known as Banu Israel, that, O oh, children of Israel, remember my favor, which I bestowed upon you, and that I preferred you to the alameen. Now we know that before the arrival of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, the favored nation was Banu Israel. They were the favored ones. And as we know that they went through a very hard time. They went through a very, very hard time. But at the end of that hard time, Allah Almighty basically allowed these people to be liberated. We would learn that when Prophet Muhammad enters Medina Tul Munawwara, he finds that the Jewish community fast on the 10th of Muharram. We will learn about that. That the Jewish community used to fast on the 10th of Muharram. When investigation took place that why? The Prophet of Allah was informed that on this day, Banu Israel were liberated and Fir'aun drowned with his armies. So they celebrated that day. They celebrated that day and basically, they made it a day of fasting. Now, I'm a person that has studied from the subcontinent. But I have been doing imamat in the West for the last 28 years. So the topic that I'm going to touch upon is a very, very important topic. And if I am growing and evolving as a scholar, I would like my community to evolve as well. I don't want you to remain stagnant because we have found that in the last 30 or 40 years, petty issues 
have allowed our Muslim community to become weak. We have been fragmented. We have been divided. We have been scattered into different groups, into different sects. So much so that a time has come that many Muslims will not pray behind other Muslims. Now one of the matters of contention is the birth of Prophet Muhammad Wasallam. It's a very important topic. I studied from Pakistan. I've been here for 28 years. I've seen the harm this has caused in my country. And I can see the harm that it causes in our community. And we're a very small community. There's one group that will celebrate the birth of Nabi Akri Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And then there will be another group that will start giving fatwas that it is haram. Now as a community that is growing, and as a community that understands, we need to take the middle path. It's very, very important. The first question that we need to pose to one another is that the birth of the Prophet of Allah, is it a blessing? Can anyone debate about the Prophet of Allah's birth being a blessing? No? So Nabi Akrima Muhammad's birth is a blessing. If Allah Almighty says to Bani Israel that remember the favors that I have bestowed upon you, then does that law apply to Ummate Muhammad? We're going to build this, build this, so we get a middle path. Because I don't want to endorse either party. We want to follow something that will unite us rather than break us. Because breaking is very easy. I was very, very fiery in the early days. People that were, I was a very fiery scholar in the early days. And in my fiery approach, I may have damaged the community. And I say this on recording. But it takes time for people to understand what they have said. So that's why now after 28 years, I'm a bit more mature. That's why I take this middle path. What does Allah Almighty say in Surah Ali Imran? لَقَدْ مَنَّ اللَّهُ عَلَى الْمُؤْمِنِينَ إِذْ بَعَثَ فِيهِمْ رَسُولًا Indeed, Allah conferred a great favor on the believers when he sent among them a messenger. So the Prophet of Allah has come to us. He's a favor. He's a bounty. He's a blessing. Now the question is, Indeed, the Prophet of Allah came, he's a blessing. The day of his birth is a blessing for mankind. Because the entire journey starts with the birth of the Prophet of Allah. True? Now, we can't deny that. But we're talking about a certain way of celebrating the birth of Prophet Muhammad And you can read between the lines. There's one group that says it's okay. The other group says it's an innovation. But no one can deny that his coming is a favor. So we need to understand, is this an innovation? What is an innovation? And what is not an innovation? Because only Muslims are going to celebrate the birth of the Prophet. The shaitan is not going to celebrate. Shaitan won't celebrate the birth of the Prophet of Allah. The enemies of Islam will not celebrate the birth of Prophet Muhammad It's not a good day for them. It's a good day for us. It's a good day for the believers. But the question is, did the Sahaba celebrate? Now you're going to say you've heard this is stagnant, but I'm going to take a twist in a few moments. Did the Sahaba celebrate the birth of Prophet Muhammad This is a proof that is presented by one group. So when we study, we say no, they didn't celebrate. Did they love the Prophet of Allah? The people that celebrate nowadays, let's question ourselves. Are they doing this out of love? Or do they hate the Prophet of Allah? The people that are celebrating the birth of Prophet Muhammad Sallam, just we're talking about the celebration. Are they doing this out of love of Prophet Muhammad Sallam or hatred? Love. All right. 
So you know what the middle path is? Indeed, the Prophet of Allah did not celebrate his own birthday. The Sahaba that loved him the most did not celebrate his birthday. We understand that. But if a person expresses gratitude to Allah Almighty and randomly around those days he holds a function in which he speaks about the Prophet of Allah without thinking it as a part of the religion, then there's no problem. There's no problem in that. But if the person, he says that you have to celebrate on this day, you have to celebrate on this day, and if you don't celebrate on this day, you are not a lover of the Prophet of Allah, by action and by thought and by speech, they upgrade that program, that will be wrong. Keep that in mind. So let's say as Imam Uzair of Holland Park Mosque, next year in the month of Rabi Awwal, let's say on the 10th of Rabi Awwal, I sit down and I say, let's come together and let's speak about Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu birth and let's speak about his legacy. There's no harm in that. There is no harm in that because I don't believe it to be compulsory. But I do celebrate, I do rejoice, and I am happy because I'm a Muslim that the Prophet of Allah was born on this day. And by action I prove that it is not compulsory because I don't do it every year. I may do it once in a blue moon. Then there's no harm in this. Do not be rigid on these issues. So if somebody is celebrating, don't go out with the gun of haram, haram, haram and shoot people and say bid'ah, bid'ah, bid'ah. This has caused big friction. It has broke the unity of the ummah. There's emotions involved in this. And I tell you, when we go out with a gun of bid'ah and haram, and people are emotionally attached to the Prophet of Allah, and they're doing this out of love, the only thing that comes in their mind is not the argument. It is that these people don't love the Prophet of Allah. This breaks the unity. And I say, because this is recorded, I say to my brothers on the other side, that celebrate the birth of Prophet Muhammad You celebrate. I don't call it haram. I don't even call it innovation nowadays. But by your practice, if somebody does not come to the program, do not label them as disrespectful to the Prophet of Allah. This is the middle path. Somebody's not going to the program, no worries. Somebody's going to the program, no worries. As long as we consider that the program on that day or in that month is not compulsory. It's not compulsory. I'm just doing it for education, no problem. There's no problem in this. And that's how we evolve. That's how we mature. And that's how we grow as a community. We find room for accommodation. Because at the end of the day, all these people, celebrating or not celebrating, they are Muslims and they all love Nabi Akrim Muhammad And each one of us are ready to put our life on the line for the Nabi of Allah. So remember that. All right. Now, <clears throat> I wanted to attach to this something. So this topic becomes very clear in our mind. Not many enemies of the Prophet of Allah have been made mentioned by name in the Quran. But there is one, and he's the uncle who has been made mentioned by name in the Quran. His name is Abu Lahab. Now the references that I'm going to give you are from Sahih al-Bukhari. Kitab nikah And Alama ibn Hajar Asqalani's commentary on Sahih al-Bukhari. So I'm going to make mention of three Stories that are attachments. Abu Lahab had a female slave whose name was Thuwaiba. Normally in, in the subcontinent they call it Thobia. It's not Thobia, it's Thuwaiba. Thuwaiba. She was a female slave. And she's the one who suckled Prophet Muhammad and suckled Hazrat Hamza. So she becomes the Radai mother, the foster mother, and Hazrat Hamza, the uncle, and Prophet Muhammad become foster brothers. 
So when Hazrat Amna binte Wahab radiyallahu ta'ala anha was giving birth to Nabi Akareem Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Abdul Muttalib or Abu Lahab sorry Abu Lahab said to Suwayba go and assist Amna go and assist Amna now Abu Lahab is a kafir we know that he died as a kafir as well he died as a non-believer remember that it's in the Quran we made mention of a principle two three weeks ago that when it comes to the family of the Prophet of Allah if nothing has been made mention explicitly in the Quran and the Hadith, then don't give your fatwa. Don't say they're kafir. Just remain silent. If it is explicit, then you can say whatever you want, like Abu Lahab. So Abu Lahab sends Suwayba to assist Amina in the delivery of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa She comes out after some time and she gives glad tidings to Abu Lahab. She says, your brother's wife, meaning Abdullah, is the brother of Abu Lahab. Your brother's wife, Amina, has given birth to a baby boy. This is in Sahih al-Bukhari, Kitab al-Nikah. So immediately, Abu Lahab was over the moon because he had lost his brother. Abdullah had died very early. And everyone was fond of Abdullah. The father was fond of Abdul Muttalib and the brothers were fond of him as well. And he died. So now this is the sign, the nishani of our brother, this child. So Abu Lahab is over the moon. So in that moment of ecstasy and enjoyment and happiness, he says to Suwayba, I free you. Anti Hurra. You are a free lady. You are a free lady. Now, in Sahih al-Bukhari Kitab al-Nikah, it has been made mention that one family member saw Abu Lahab in a dream after his demise and found him in a very, very difficult position. He was in a very, very difficult position. Most probably he was being punished. He was being punished. And when the discussion took place between the person who seen the dream and Abu Lahab, Abu Lahab said that this punishment is perpetual. I am not given relief. But I did something that Allah Almighty rewarded me for. And the reward is that the intensity of the punishment is decreased. And it is decreased because of the good deed that I freed Suwayba on the birth of Nabi Akrim Muhammad this is Sayyid Bukhari Kitab al Nikah. Got it? So Abu Lahab, a kafir, and we can say this with any doubt, he is been given some relief in the punishment, in the fire of hell, because he expressed happiness on the birth of Muhammad by freeing Suwayba. Now, Alama ibn Hajar Askalani is one of the greatest commentators of Sayyid Bukhari. In his famous commentary of Fathul Bari, he makes mention under this that Hazrat Abbas, who is the brother of Abu Lahab, and only two uncles of the Prophet of Allah accepted Islam, Abu Lahab, um, Hazrat Hamza, and Hazrat Abbas. Hazrat Abbas says, I saw my brother Abu Lahab in a dream after one year. Who said this? Hazrat Abbas, radiallahu ta'ala. So Hazrat Abbas radiallahu ta'ala says, I saw my brother in a dream after one year. And when we started discussing, he made mention that he is in a lot of pain. He's in a lot of pain. But then he said that every Monday, Alam ibn Hajr al-Skalani, in Fathul Bari, every Monday, that adab is reduced. Every Monday for Abu Lahab, the adab is reduced. And Hazrat Abbas radiallahu ta'ala, he comments further upon this that is in Fathul Bari as well. The reason behind it is on Monday, Abu Lahab freed Suwayba. <laughs> that was the day that the Prophet of Allah was born. How amazing is that? 
So that's why don't be too rigid and limited in your approach to Islam. I'm not saying go out and celebrate. I can see the harms of this in my country. That there's no boundaries now. I understand that. I understand where the scholars are coming from. But we are educated people in this community. We don't do foolish things like that. So if somebody is speaking about the Prophet of Allah in a masjid, don't go out with the bid'ah gun. Don't start shooting fatwas. <laughs> the Prophet of Allah was born in Rabi'ul Awwal, as we will make mention. We are allowed to express that we are happy. It was the day our Prophet of Allah was born. If Abu Lahab, a kafir, can benefit in the fire of hell, because he expressed happiness by freeing a slave. If we express happiness, won't we benefit from this? As long as, once again, as long as we do not consider it to be compulsory. This is very, very important. What makes it innovation is when you consider it to be compulsory. Do you think, can I get a nod, do you think that is a middle ground? And do you think if we work with this, we can unite the community? And that's how we unite the community. Working in the community, trying to come up with something that we can unite rather than break up. All right. So that was the first topic. Now, Allah Almighty makes mention in, and we spoke about this Sunday with our Malaysian Tafsir group. This is Surat Ibrahim, Surat number 14. And if you look at verse number 5, Allah Almighty says, وَلَقَدْ أَرْسَلْنَا مُوسَى بِآيَاتِنَا أَنْ أَخْرِجْ قَوْمَكَ مِنَ الظُّلُمَاتِ إِلَى النُّورِ And the fragment I want you to capture and focus upon is, وَذَكِّرْهُمْ بِأَيَّامِ اللَّهِ and indeed, we sent Musa with our ayat, with our proofs, bring out our people from darkness into light and make them remember the books of, or the pages of history, the annals of Allah, the, the pages of history. Why? Because therein are evidences, proofs, and signs for every patient, thankful person. We learn from history. We learn from history. We learn from the greatest history chapter. And that is the chapter of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. We cry with the Prophet of Allah. We laugh with the Prophet of Allah. We rejoice with the Prophet of Allah. Every part of the Prophet's legacy is a bounty for us. And we are indebted to Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam to learn about him, to celebrate his life. Right? So just keep that in mind. This verse is a very important verse that we need to learn from history. Now, let's go to the birth of the Prophet of Allah. When did the birth of the Prophet of Allah take place? So when you start peeling pages from history, there is so much written upon this. There is so much written upon this. But there are some things that are unanimous. And there are some things that are not unanimous. So let's focus upon the things that are unanimous. What is unanimous is the month. Prophet Muhammad was born in Rabiul Awwal. That is unanimous. That is unanimous. When I say unanimous, over 90%. Over 90% unanimous. So over 90%, they say that the Prophet of Allah was born in Rabiul Awwal. The second point that the scholars are unanimous. It was the year in which Abraha was destroyed. Known as Amul Fil. This is unanimous. This is 100%. So all scholars say the year the Prophet of Allah was born in Rabiul Awwal. It was the year where Allah Almighty destroyed Abraha and his armies. Alam tara kayfa fa'ala rabbuka bi ashabil fil. Got it? The third thing where scholars find themselves unanimous is the day. The day is Monday. The day is Monday. So Prophet Muhammad was born on Monday. The fourth, semi-unanimous. Semi. Muzabza bina bina dal half half. And that is the time. So we find some narrations that say night time. Some people say morning. The reconciliation is the crack of dawn. Because that has a connection with the night and with the day. So majority scholars, after studying different 
reports pertaining to the time, they come to this understanding that it is at the crack of dawn, Fajr time, because it is dark, but it is light. So all those statements in which it has been said that the Prophet of Allah was born at night time, they can be taken in. And all those that say it was the daytime, they can be taken in. Reconciliation is the crack of dawn, Subai Sadiq. That is the time Prophet Muhammad was born. Where was he born? Oh, there's so much upon this. But majority scholars are, have an inclination that he was born in the house of Abu Talib. He was born in the house of Abu Talib. But in Makkah al Mukarramah, there are some narrations he was born in Rome. <laughs> I read that as well. So, whoa. But he was born in Makkah in the house of Abu Talib. All right. The date. There are three dates now. The 8th, the 9th, and the 12th. There's many more, but we're going to focus upon three. The 8th, the 9th, and the 12th. Of which month? Rabbul Awal. 8th, 9th, and 12th. What is more popular in the Muslim communities? The 12th. That comes as third position. That comes as third position. It is really between the 8th and the 9th. It's not the 12th. So if we were to rank them, give them grades... According to scholarship, number three is the twelfth of Rabiul Awal. It is between the eighth and the ninth. Now, Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhuma and Jubair bin Mat'am, they make mention that the Prophet of Allah was born on the eighth of Rabiul Awal. He was born on the eighth of Rabiul Awal. Mahmoud Pasha, the great astronomer from Egypt, after his calculations, and we can't disregard that because they got the gadgets. He says the ninth of Rabi'ul Awal. The great uh, astronomer from Egypt, Mahmoud Pasha, he says on the ninth of Rabi'ul Awal, Prophet Muhammad was born. What was the English date? Which month? January, February, March, April. Unanimously, it is April. So Prophet Muhammad was born in April, 570 or 571. It's between 70 and 71. And mo majority scholars say the 20th of April. And a few scholars say the 21st of April. You got all that information? Let's put it together now. So Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was born 570 70 in April on the 20th of April. Got it? He was born in the house of Abu Talib. It was the month of Rabi'ul Awal. All right. It was the year in which Allah Almighty destroyed Abraha and his armies. It was the 8th of Rabi al Awal according to Abdullah ibn Abbas and Jabir bin Mat'am. And according to the modern astronomer, it was the 9th of Rabi al Awal. There are a few people that go for the 12th. But indeed, the Prophet of Allah has arrived in the month of Rabi al Awal. Now, so we have discussed the, the time, the date, the month. Now, did anything happen around this time? So now when you start diving into the books of history, Islamic history pertaining to what occurred at the time of Prophet Muhammad's birth, you will be blown away. Now, it's very important to understand that when we are studying Prophet Muhammad and his birth and his life and the miracles, don't focus upon the Prophet. It's very, very important. Or you can lose your mind. Focus upon the power of Allah. This is very important. When we study Laylatul Isra wal Mi'raj, this is something that the mind cannot comprehend. How can a person travel in a very short portion of the night from one country to another country, from one world to another world, and return back? Now, if we only focus upon Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa doing all this, we won't be able to reconcile. But if you focus upon the attributive name of Allah that is Qadir and Muqtadir, inna allaha ala kulli shay'in qadir, then there's nothing that is impossible. Time is in his grip. Speed is in his grip. Everything is in his grip. And nothing is beyond his capacity. So he can do whatever he wants. 
Now, the miracles that took place in the time of the Prophet of Allah, they are known as mu'jizat. And the miracles that took place before he was commissioned as a prophet or before his birth are known as irhas. And we call them the muqaddamat. These are an introduction to the miracles that humanity were to see manifested on the hands of Prophet Muhammad So there were many miracles that took place before. All right, so we're going to make mention of a few now. So the first one. <coughs> Usman, this is a Sahabi, his name is Usman bin Abil As, radiyallahu ta'ala an. His mother, whose name was Fatima bint Abdullah. So Usman bin Abil As, he was Saqafi from Taif. He later on became radiyallahu ta'ala an. His mother, mother Fatima bint Abdullah, she was in the room. She was in the room when Nabi Akrima Muhammad came. Fatima bint Abdullah. Saqafi. So she says that when Nabi Akrim Muhammad entered this world, when he entered this world, I was present. I looked outside and I could see that the Kaaba had been illuminated. So the Kaaba was like it was a lamp. It became like noor. The entire room was lit up. So the Prophet of Allah enters the world, Kaaba is lit up, it becomes noor, like a lamp, and the house becomes like a lamp. Because of the noor of the Prophet of Allah, the light. She said, I look towards the sky, Fatima binti Abdullah, the mother of Usman bin Abil As. I look towards the sky and I felt that the stars were moving towards me. It was like the stars were coming down. Towards the house of Nabi Akri Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This was the observation of Fatima bint Abdullah. Now, a lot of scholars have attached to this story, this verse. Ya ahl al-kitab, why was the stars coming down? Ya ahl al-kitab, qad ja'akum rasooluna yubayyinu lakum kathira mimma كُنْتُمْ تُخْفُونَ مِنَ الْكِتَابِ وَيَعْفُوا أَنْ كَثِيرٌ قَدْ جَاءَكُمْ مِنَ اللَّهِ نُورٌ وَكِتَابٍ مُبِينٌ O people of the scripture, Jews and Christians, none has come to you, no, no, uh, now has come to you our messenger, explaining to you much of that which you used to hide from the scripture and passing over much. Indeed, there has come to you from Allah a light and a plain book. This light is the light of the Quran and the teachings of the Prophet of Allah. So these stars were coming down to show respect to the one that is going to bring light. Because the function of the stars in the sky, in, in the sky is light. So many, many scholars have attached this to this. Now, the second story. Arbaz bin Sariya, radiyallahu ta'ala an. And he's from Ashab Sufa. He's a very famous Sahabi, Rabaz bin Sariya. He's from Ashab Sufa. He makes mention that my mother, she was present as well at the birth of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And this is a very famous statement that when the Prophet of Allah arrived in the world, this is the power of Allah. This is receiving the Prophet of Allah. This is a grand reception of the Prophet of Allah. He said, a light emitted from Amina. It came out like this. And Hazrat Arbaz bin Sariya, he says that, Hazrat Amina made mention later on, that in that light, I could see the palaces of Syria lit up. So Allah Almighty brought Syria right in front of Hazrat Amina bin Tawahab. So Syria was right in front of her. Now you will say, how is this possible? Didn't Allah Almighty bring the janazah of Wahshi, uh, Najashi in front of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam from Abyssinia? Yes, we're going to read about that. Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is standing and he's going to lead the janazah. Sahaba can't see. Najashi passes away in Ethiopia, Abyssinia, and the janazah is brought in front of the Prophet of Allah. Can Allah do this? Allah can do this. 
Can the Prophet of Allah do this? No. no. Can Allah do this? Allah do this. Allah can do it. So as that Amina bint Wahab, she could see the palaces of Syria lit up. And why the palaces of Syria? Because a time is going to come that this, these palaces will be in the control of Muhammad and his army. Sallallahu alayhi wa So this is another thing. Abdul Rahman ibn Awf is one of the early people that accepted Islam. His mother's name is Shifa. Abdul Rahman ibn Awf's mother's name is Shifa. One of the reasons why Abdul Rahman ibn Awf accepted Islam that is not known to us is this reason. Shifa was present there. Abdul Rahman ibn Awf's mother was there, present. When Prophet Muhammad came out into this world, and as children, sometimes they make noise. So the Prophet of Allah, so she was holding Shifa, the mother of Abdul Rahman ibn Awf. She was holding the Nabi of Allah. And the Nabi of Allah said something, like a child, <laughs> like this. And suddenly from nowhere, Shifa heard somebody say, Rahimakallah, Allah have mercy upon you. She looked around, who is this person? Who is speaking to the Prophet of Allah? Who is speaking? Looked to the right, looked to the left, could not see anyone. Then suddenly, a light emerged, the light that we are alluding to. And suddenly then it became dark. And the child disappeared. Child gone. Now she's looking at her arms and there's no child there. And it has become dark. After light, it has become dark. She's looking around and now she hears somebody conversing. The person is saying, where have you taken Muhammad? And the person says, we have taken him to see the entire world. To show him to the entire creation between Mashrik and Maghrib. So take him to the entire world so they can see him and he can see the world. Then the darkness left and light came once again and the baby Muhammad was in the hands of Shifa. So Shifa says, I remember that and I was waiting for him to grow up so I can accept Islam. So Shifa, the mother and the son Abdul Rahman ibn Awf became one of the early Muslims. Became one of the early Muslims. These are all stories, all right. In Madinatul Munawwara, so Prophet Muhammad is born in which city? Mecca. So in Madinatul Munawwara, there's a person by the name of Azad Hassan bin Sabit, who later becomes the official poet of Nabi Akri Muhammad. True? Hassan bin Sabit. He's only seven years old. Prophet Muhammad is born. He's only seven years old in Madinatul Munawwara. A Jewish person comes out. He looks towards the sky. The sun has risen. And he starts shouting to his brothers, to his community. He says, all of you come. He says, tonight was the night. I swear it by God Almighty that tonight was the night that Muhammad Sallallahu was born. Hazrat Hassan bin Sabit was listening to this. He was amazed that how did this person know? Not only the coming of the Prophet of Allah, but the environment at that time was spoken of in the early scriptures. They had, so, they had so much information pertaining to the coming of the Prophet of Allah, they knew the night in which the Prophet of Allah came. The grandson of Hassan bin Sabit, his name was Saeed, he was once asked by a scholar, that what was the age of Hazrat Hassan bin Sabit when Prophet Muhammad came to Medina to Munawwar? He said Hazrat Hassan bin Sabit was 60. Prophet Muhammad was 53. Once again, it confirms that this incident took place in Medina to Munawwar on the birth of Prophet Muhammad and Hazrat Hassan bin Sabit was how old? Seven years old. Hazrat Aisha Siddiqa radiallahu ta'ala anha says that in Makkah al as we have spoken about this when speaking about the lineage, people were not allowed to live there that were not son of the soil, that were not sons of the soil. But there was one Jewish person that used to travel and because of his tijara and because of his buying and selling, he was allowed to stay for a few days in Makkah al The day the Prophet of Allah was born, in the morning he went and he started asking people, he said, amongst the Quraysh, 
Can you tell me, has any female given birth to a baby boy? Has anyone given birth to a baby boy? So they said, yes, there's one child that was born early, early morning. So he said, take me to that child. Take me to that child. Imam Bahki makes mention of this. So they took him to Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He said, show me the back. He looked at the face. He said, show me the back. And we're going to speak about the back and the, and the seal of prophethood next week. So show me the back. He went and he looked at the back and he could see the seal of prophethood between the two shoulder blades. He fell, he fainted. He fell, he fainted and he woke up. He recovered after some time. And he says, I swear today the day has come that prophethood has exited the lineage of Israel towards Ismail. And this child that you see right now, his name will echo throughout the entire world. And all these powers that you see around, they will submit in front of him. All right. We've run out of time. All right. So once again, recap or recap of what we have studied. Inshallah, this will continue for maybe one or two more weeks. There's beautiful stories pertaining to this. Increases our love for Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But once again, this is the taqat, the qudrat of Allah. Allah can do whatever he wants. And for his for his saints, for his awliya, for his prophets, and for the khatimul anbiya, the best of prophets, he can do whatever he wants. Okay. Right. So, I think the most important message of today for my sisters and my brothers, let's be people that unite. Don't be people that break the community. If there's room for any accommodation, use that accommodation. Don't make the mistakes that we have made in the past. I'm going to share with you a statement that I shared yesterday with the group. We learn from history that we don't learn from history. We learn from history that we don't learn from history. We've been fighting like anything. <laughs> don't want to use the word cats and dogs. But we've been fighting for a long, long time. Shouldn't be fighting upon these issues. We are all Muslims. We all love the Nabi of Allah. All right. As long as we have a clear understanding, we can express our happiness as long as we don't consider it to be compulsory. Just that's, that's it, nothing else. Then we made mention of the story of Abu Lahab. Eh? And we made mention that this is in Sayyid Bukhari and then extension to this in the commentary of Sayyid Bukhari, Alam ibn Hajr Askalani. And what was that? That on Monday he is given some relief. And why is he given relief? Because on Monday he freed the female slave. Suwayba. So even at home, if you say Alhamdulillah, if you say Alhamdulillah, this is the day, or you say this is the month that Allah, you gave us, Nabi Akrim, Jazakum Allah, Allah, you know, Allah give jaza to the Prophet of Allah, Allah, thank you very much, Alhamdulillah, you'll be rewarded for this. But if you celebrate it in a manner that it becomes like religion, and it becomes the symbol of religion, and it becomes the symbol of loving the Prophet of Allah, that is a problem. <laughs> that is a problem. So just keep that in mind. All right. Then we made mention of the different um, uh, opinions pertaining to the date of the Prophet of Allah's birth. So what was it? 570 or 571? It was the month of January? April. It was the 20th or the 21st, all right? Yeah, 20th, 20, 21st, all right. Which year was this? The year of the Abraha. Arm will feel the year of the elephant. All right. Which month? Islamic month? All right. Uh, time? About Fajr time. 8th, 9th, or 12th? What is more? 8th or 9th? What is more popular? The 12th. No worries. All right. Whose house? Abu Talib's house. He was born. All right. So we made mention of the first story Usman bin Abil As. Um, and his mother, Fatima binti Abdullah, she was there. She saw that the Kaaba was lit up, the house was lit up, and the stars were dropping down. All right? So this was to show respect and honor to Prophet Muhammad Then Arbaz bin Sariya, the Ashab Sufa person, he makes mention that Amina says that I saw the Muhallat, the palaces of Syria lit up. So there's an indication in this that Prophet Muhammad will be given control over all these areas. Then we made mention of Azad Hassan bin Sabit in Medina al Munawwara. The Jewish person came and he made mention that Nabuwat has exited. Eh? And uh, 
the child is born tonight or the, the child is born today and uh, Azad Hassan bin Sabit was only seven years old. Then we made mention of the riwayat of Azad Aisha Siddiqa in Makkah al Mukarramah that uh, she makes mention that that Jewish person, he came, he saw the seal of prophethood and he said that prophethood has exited Banu Israel towards Banu Ismail. 